The 2004 Grammy award-winning album, American Idiot, has been hailed as a modern masterpiece, and its effect on the international reputation of Green Day cannot be overestimated. Punk's one of these subcultures that's never really died, always been there bubbling on the underground, and really kind of bringing the American Idiot album out is the thing that's launched them back into the US and the UK scenes. The timing was right for them to come back, I think, um, with, a, with an album that was sort of politically minded in a time when it was really needed. It was time for the, sort of, the godfathers of this new wave of punk bands to come along and remind people how it's done properly, I think. They said, we need to do an album how we feel it needs to be done. And they, they said, we're going to do it until we feel it. And apparently they felt it. The music they play, especially with American Idiot, was it took them to a whole new level in terms of maturity and they sort of come to the next level saying we can still do that shit but you know we can do, do other stuff as well. This is the independent critical review of the album that rocked the world. The how and why of American Idiot and how it works its magic. Nice. Green Day grew out of a very focused vision. Billy Joe Armstrong and bassist Mike Durnt had been childhood friends who shared a passion for punk music, which had given birth to a three-piece punk band called Sweet Children. On reaching the ripe old age of 17, Billy Joe and Mike changed the name of the band to Green Day. The classic Green Day lineup was completed by the arrival of drummer Trey Cool, who joined in 1990. All three were strict devotees of the values and attitudes of the punk rock movement. Punk rock's always been around. It's not a revival. It's just, you know, what people are seeing in the mainstream are like offshoots of punk that just happen to have gotten caught into the mainstream, or you know, bands that have been around and went that direction. They they still fly the flag for for punk music, but it's a little bit smarter. It has more of an image. You know, they've perhaps had a had a shower, and you know, it's just a little bit more cleaned up, but still has the roots of of, of punk music. These guys are truly punks, and you know they, they maintain that in their actions and, and how they behave, but in the same sense, they know what they, they, they know what they're alive for, and that's to be musicians. There's always been a big argument as to whether they were a punk band, even from, from early on within the punk scene of which they were very much a part of, just because they were such a kind of poppy, melodic band, but at the same time a lot of, sort of hardline punks, if you like. You know, they're still into the band, they're still into Green Day, um, and that's lasted, um, it hasn't gone. So, when they released American Idiots, they did still have that credibility amongst you know, certain factions of the, the punk community. I think when you talk about Green Day in terms of being a punk band, you've really got to sit and think about what punk is. Punk in the US is so totally different from punk in the UK. I think it was much harder here in the UK because we were much more industrialised and we had much more angst going on, so it was a much more harder aggressive edge to the punk uh, thing from the youth culture. Um, but punk is a term that's always been used in America um, for a street kid, a kid on the street. You punk. Get out of here, you punk! And you know uh, the whole idea of the Ramones, the jeans, the ripped jeans, the white T-shirt with the leather jacket on, the long unkempt hair—they were punk. The corporate music of the 70s had uh, uh, been so manipulated and controlled to some degree, there was so much money involved, they were starting to go, wow, we can make so much money out of this. And uh, you know, you couldn't get people to hear your demos, you couldn't afford to record demos, and, and the kids decided to do it for themselves. That's it, you know, that's all it was. And they went, well, yeah, well, I can't play too good, I can't sing, so what? We want to be in a band, why shouldn't we? Punk. 
And you know, that's, I think that was the godfathers, the Ramones who were that. They were like, yeah, okay, so we're four kids, nobody gives a shit, we've got torn jeans, we sit around on the street, why don't we do something? Let's have a band then. There is little doubt that the Ramones were a huge influence on the band. And in 2003, when the New York legends were posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Green Day were finally able to repay the compliment. Billy Joe Armstrong is on record as saying that um, it was the Ramones, along with, along with a few other bands like um, the Skidoo and the, and the Clash. Um, it was the Ramones who really showed the band how music could be, in that it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't have to have big guitar solos like Van Halen. It can be fast, it can be pared down, it can be lean, but it can also be really melodic, really poppy, you know, as, as instant as anything by the Beatles or the Kinks, but with this sort of same energy of, of all the best rock bands. They were certainly inspired more by the American pop punk sound than the kind of British pop punk sound, so definitely inspired by bands like the Ramones. I would say probably less inspired by the British bands, although bands like the Buzzcocks and the Undertones produce this kind of pop punk basically. <laughs> Buzzcocks record until after we recorded our second album, but you know, hey, if we sound like them, I guess we're not doing too bad a thing. The Buzzcocks, uh, Pete Shelley in particular, uh, rather than just throwing stuff out, I think he began to begin to craft songs much more, and that I would say is if the Ramones give Green Day their energy, uh, uh, the the construction line, the harmony, the vocal line, the, the whole approach to the melody was. Uh, 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 with direct reference to the Buzzcocks. I mean, if you read the lyrics of the Buzzcocks, a lot of it's quite kind of soppy, it's like teenage poetry, but it's really, it's really powerful stuff in, it, in its own way. And um, that influence is, is visible in Green Day's work when you, if, you know, particularly some of their early recordings when they're on Lookout Records, almost exclusively Billy Joe was writing songs about girls or fancying girls or breaking up with girls or you know your parents or just how how sort of confusing life can be as a teenager and that's that's really what they took from the buzz club. by 1978-79 the uk punk scene had all but fizzled out into the empty posturing of the new wave bands or the cliched mohican sporting punk bands of thatcher's britain and for 10 years punk went back underground on both sides of the atlantic existing once again in small clubs and the pages of fanzines. In the early 90s, however, the punk touch paper had been relit. When Nirvana first came out into the music scene, which was really sort of the beginning of the 90s, they were very much, a lot of people were describing the whole grunge sound as a sort of a, a bit punky. It, it raised the uh, visibility of those kids playing angst-driven music and wanting to say something and you know that brought the platform back up which had disappeared you know it was gone it had disappeared. After Nirvana the record companies went looking for the next new thing um, and suddenly there was you know hundreds of A&R men were trolling the, the clubs of America looking for a band who'd come from a small town who were angry, stroppy, did their own thing, looked good and Green Day with that band who spoke the first band after Nirvana really to speak to a bunch of kids who wanted something to call their own really and that's that's where Green Day came in. I just think it was the time back then for, for something new and for something fresh you know in the 90s and I can understand it if you sort of compare them with Nirvana because you know Nirvana were a three-piece loud band and, and so are Green Day but if you, you sort of read in between the lines there's you know, there's not too many similarities in music. I'd say they're pretty different and, and keep them apart, you know. 
As the group grew bigger, there were those who inevitably questioned whether the group had completely sold out their punk rock roots. The turning point came when they released Dookie in 1994. It was released on Warner Brothers and there was a, a lot of argument, a lot of speculation at the time. The sort of punk community was very, very much split as to whether, whether they were sellouts or whether they had anything to sell out in the first place. When you're in a band and you become popular and you become popular in the mainstream because your music not only appeals to your fans but appeals to single buyers and album buyers and, and, and new fans. I think whenever that happens, people will make me think, oh, man, they're selling out. I think it's a strange thing to say, and I know that so many kids are very sort of cautious of, oh, this band's sold out, that band's sold out, all at their number one in the charts, or we don't like them anymore. And I do think it's a strange thing to say. Well, yeah, I liked them yesterday because they were in that little bar down the road, but now they're in a big stadium. Uh, uh, you know, they've lost everything for me. I say, but uh, it, it, did you still get the meaning of Green Day? Do you still get the statements? Are you still hearing their voices being part of your voice? And if you own the album, it doesn't matter whether they're in a stadium with 100,000 people or sitting in your mum's garage, you know, with just your dad sitting in the car. It's the same band they're doing the same thing. I've been playing a whole bunch of these dinosaur shows, you know, and everything's way huge. The amount of people, the places, the, all that, you know. It's just, just a lot. I don't know, you know, you're playing to, to the masses instead of relating by seeing everyone's head in the back of the club or something. But it's, it is just kind of ironic, you know, a year ago we were playing really small clubs, you know. A groundbreaking appearance at the Woodstock 2 Festival cemented the band's newfound status. And from that point onwards, there was no looking back. Basket Case became an MTV favorite and the group were firmly on the map. You know, the MTV took on to them very early on. And of course, you know, it's like being played in college radio in America or, or national radio. That's the leap. Um, you know, you can be on the college circuit, but you don't hit everywhere in America. As soon as you get played nationally, bang, that's it. And, you know, MTV uh, has that capacity. And if, if they take you on, then that's a world market you've just gone into immediately. That MTV uh, and taking them on and, and playing their stuff just uh, exposed them massively. American Idiot is without doubt the most politically inspired album by Green Day to date. It has been described by the band as a punk opera, which some critics were quick to point out is a contradiction in terms. I'm really not 100% convinced I'm really understanding what the term punk opera means. It's, it's just, it sounds like a bizarre word that was used just to stick on a press release to get people scratching their heads and wondering what on earth it means because I think, you know, that is the effect that it's had. It's a concept album. Really, it was inspired by bands like The Who, you know, with, who, who did things like Tommy, which were sort of concepts, which again, shouldn't really be confused with the concept albums of the 70s, which were all about Lord of the Rings and King Arthur and things like that. I think Green Day really wanted to make a record of substance with some stories interwoven into it and a kind of a message, a, a weight behind it if you like. They just basically booked the studio just to experiment, to, to find out what they needed to do as artists. And apparently they found out, you know, it was, you know, definitely what they were feeling at the time and, you know, it was like they were making making something that they were meant to do. In the lyrics of American Idiot, there is clearly a great deal of frustration over how the individual is disenfranchised by the forces of commercialization. Billy Joe Armstrong in particular has made no secret of his dislike for George W. Bush and all he stands for. It didn't take a political analyst to work out just who the American Idiot was. All right, this next song is to George Bush, all right? As a complete work, Billy Joe's new songs coalesced into a more refined portrait, one of a nation ruled by an idiot, misinformed by a media, and subjugated to a worldwide redneck agenda, all seen through the eyes of the everyman voices of its character, and set against a backdrop of shopping malls, 
empty suburban streets, booze, cigarettes and burning flags. The song spoke of a country asleep, numbed by narcotics and subliminal advertising, and only awakening long enough to tap into a nationwide post-9-11 paranoia and ever-present consumerism. Clearly, through Green Day's eyes, the American dream was actually a nightmare. He is in an environment that's being dictated to by television and consumerism. Uh, they're being told lies, which you have to believe because if you don't believe, then you're not being, you know, uh, you're, you're not being uh, honourable to your country. You're not being patriotic. And you go, well, yeah, but what if I don't believe it? What if I don't believe it? Then what? I'm, is it just me? It's just me who doesn't believe it. And I think it's there for this journey through this discovery of, you know, shouting out against these things. You know, what, what is going on? Why is nobody listening? What, you know, is it just me alone? But then finds there is, it isn't just him alone. You know, it's, it's many people alone in America. It, it was written in the wake of September the 11th. It was written in the wake of George Bush becoming president. And it was part of a kind of sort of wider resistance, if you like, from the underground. For the first time in a good few years, bands were, there was a lot of discontent with the government and with the notion of the American dream. That is not just all about the war, it's not just all criticism about the war, it's, it's taking almost like a personal story or a fictitious story and it's running it through as a, a kind of a theme, maybe so that kids can relate to it. People say, can rock and roll change things? Well, I think it can, um, ch if it changes your mindset for one second or makes you question anything, then yes, I think so. American Idiot opens the album with a blistering three minute polemic lambasting the brain-dead landscape of American consumerism. Right from the outset, Green Day set out their stall by telling the world everything they were against with this album opener and lead-off single. If you think back to the 90s when they had released the Dookie album, the big key song on that album was Basket Case. And in a lot of ways, American Idiot is like Basket Case Mark II. It's got that same kind of explosive sound, happy-go-lucky, the sort of the sing-along element and I think it's you know it's something that is very big with the kids. It was Green Day coming back with a punch it was it was you know it was almost formulaic in its approach it was sort of three minutes fast big chorus no nonsense it's what Green Day are known for sometimes simple as best and just by calling the song American Idiot the band immediately aligned themselves with this kind of resistance in the underground or just voices of protest really it's a, it's a protest song do you guys think anyone who voted for bush is an american idiot <laughs> no no i mean uh just a misinformed idiot but is, is he saying that he's an american idiot or is he saying that uh, his president's an american idiot uh that you're an american idiot you know that's uh all of that can be read lyrically in there all of that you know, pretty vacant for the pistols. We're so pretty, or so pretty vacant, you know. I mean, it's a statement, where? He's not saying just we are. You know, the kids are screaming out, we're so pretty. It's us, it's all of us, you know, it's all of us. Uh, and those big, you know, anthemic, successful songs where the kids can scream out, yeah, I don't want to be that either. It's written very well, it's, it's, got, it's got that punk edge. Um, you know, it starts with a, with the uh, uh, um, with the filtered guitar element. As you can see, it's quite fast moving and it's moving around really quickly. But it's only between three chords, kind of thing. And then in the verse, it's it's really the the bits that aren't playing of the guitar, which make the the verse so special. Where it's just the kick drum kicking in time with the vocals and it's just the same riff coming back in so just the same riff but broken up basically so it still has the the catchiness to it and stuff and uh, then when it goes into the chorus it's um And so 
it's you know it's changing the whole thing but not too much and it's all all very powerful in the rhythm side of things you know I don't know if you saw I was hitting the strings quite hard and stuff just to give it that really aggressive sound Jesus of Suburbia is composed in the very unpunk key of D flat major and in its nine minutes running length manages to squeeze in enough time, key and tempo changes to keep a prog rock fan happy. No wonder some factions of the punk fraternity felt abandoned by Green Day. Uh, with Jesus of Suburbia it's a kind of an adventurous thing for a, a band like Green Day to do and something you perhaps wouldn't expect them to do. Um, basically taking five four or five songs and, and compressing them, putting them into making one long song, which is, you know, you'd expect like a, a prog rock band to do or something like that, but perhaps not Green Day. When Green Day were touring the American Idiot album, they would come on to American Idiot, then go straight into Jesus of Suburbia, which is quite a bold move, and it's quite a bold move on record. Because it's right after American Idiot, it, you know, it just droops a little. It had it came a bit further on, so you'd established it, or had it opened the album, then you could have done American Idiot and then, you know, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's not on the whole, it's, it's not terrible and stuff, but could have had a, probably a better position on the album, maybe. It does drone on a bit, it's quite flat, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. It's one of these songs where you have it playing and it'll sort of get about halfway through and you think, oh, are we still on the same song? Oh, it couldn't possibly be lasting this long. And it does. The way uh, Jesus of Suburbia starts out, is on these, these big chords, which is going from a, a D-flat to a B-flat. And it carries on in that kind of fashion. On the changeover at the end of the chorus, to take it into the next part of the song, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, because they change those chords slightly. It's instead of going to the B flat, it's actually going to an F. So it's then to the F, and then up to a B flat. drums dropped to half time and, and now the whole thing's got a much softer approach. And if you listen to that chord progression, it's very much like all the young dudes kind of thing. The, the staggering, um, the chords that are gradually working their way down through the scale kind of thing, you know, you've got the... Going into I Don't Care, which is the next part of the song, you hear it, it kind of picks up the, the tempo and it picks up the, the general vibe of the song. The thing that makes that riff so catchy is, is the fact that it keeps going back to the, the D flat, which is the... And it's very pronounced kind of thing, almost like a chant on the guitar. And it's the way that the, the two chords move around it. So you're going from... Then it's changing chord but still coming back to the D-flat. Going back, so when you put it all together. the most dominant chord in there is this one which is the same the same chord that's been used throughout the whole song um, so far so that yet the the song hasn't changed key and it's all been based around this one D flat so it's kind of like Green Day's way of, of showing how many different styles and, and types of music they can make around one key and one go kind of thing you know
The transition from uh, I don't care into dearly beloved is, is quite an obvious one and you'll hear the, the chord sort of holds and the key changes as well to an A. So again, it's bringing the whole song down, um, and you'll hear that it's the, the sound of the guitar is very different. It's not loud or anything like that. It's palm muted, so basically you're putting this part of your hand on the strings there, and with the, the chords, you, you're sort of tapping them on and off the neck, so you get a very sort of uh, individual sound, like a good break up in, in all the chords, so it's this kind of. The whole feel of the song changes again completely and becomes a whole lot heavier. It actually starts just when it goes straight in going just to the bass line, so the bass is just going and then the guitar is coming in just for that and the, the bass is sort of filling the gap in between and then taking it up to the, uh, the next level when all the drums and, and all the guitars come in. I don't feel any shame, I won't apologize When there ain't nowhere you can go The whole song has just been highs and lows kind of thing, you know, they've, they've taken you from, from really heavy hard stuff to, to soft stuff to kind of poppy stuff um, and then finish in, in true Green Day style. Holiday is an anti-war song, pointedly unveiled on April Fool's Day on the album's own internal calendar of events. It's a sentiment which is clearly not universally popular in Bush's America. Fear of being branded unpatriotic led Billy Joe to preface the song with a small disclaimer during live concerts. Thing throughout the record, and that is, it's you know, it's speaking from an individual standpoint, it's not pointing fingers necessarily, but it's, I mean, it's direct though. It's a song about protest within America. Um, one of the key lines. In the song, I think, is when Billy Joe Armstrong sings Sig Heil to the President Gasman. It's the first time I've ever heard anybody, certainly Americans, that actually say Zeke Heil on an album. So, yeah, I'm all for that. You know, uh, President Gasman, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, the senator from California has the floor. I don't want to take anything away from any intent on American Idiot, the track, you know, which does make his statement, but I think this is, just has a lot more weight to it. Uh, you know, there's a, it, it's, you know, beyond just skirting around the politics, I know everybody in government sucks anyway. It's really, really, you know, m much darker, much heavier. To be perfectly honest, when I listen to Holiday and when I listen to American Idiot, I don't think either one of them is either more or less political. I mean, the whole concept of the American Idiot album is it, it is a political album. And I think, you know, really, the two songs are both political. There are other tracks as well on the album which are also political, probably though Holiday and American Idiot being the two most political songs on the album. I don't think one is more so than the other. Boulevard of Broken Dreams was another song that illustrated just how far from punk the band were willing to stray when necessary. 
Its slow tempo and straight rock structure with a heavy reliance on keyboards was definitely not from the typical Green Day mold, and even bore a resemblance to soft rock bands of the 80s, some of whom the trio had made no secret about liking as adolescents. I walk along, I walk up. Well, the, the title comes from, there's an old uh, James Dean photo where he's uh, walking uh, in New York and he, you know, he's in a, uh, just underneath it says Boulevard of Broken Dreams. It's a great photo of him. So that's um, where I sort of nicked the title from. Uh, I remember walking into the studio um, in the morning and Mike just said, let me play you this song. We drove down the boulevard listening to that song. It's badass. Boulevard of Broken Dreams is a real anthemic song. It is a really powerful, just kind of a ballad, but it's, it's a very powerful, punky ballad. And I think that is what, it's that whole kind of contradiction of punk and ballad. I think that that's really what makes it stand out so much. It is their sort of blatant stab at kind of dominating the radio, if you like. They, they know that in this day and age, if you want to be a big rock band, you have to have hit singles. It's kind of sad but true, if you like. And um, it's, it's also like a vehicle for Billy Joe's obvious talent for, for doing more than just the three, co three chord songs like American Idiot. They freed themselves up from the limits of going, well, we have to go one, two, three, four, and we have to play three or four chords, and they have to be really angst ridden it has to be a driving beat. Here they've got an example where they can go, right, let's just write some music, and of course we're going to be writing as a band like we do write, but then let's just explore something else, see if we get a nice lick, let's not look for the, the next opportunity to, to put a distorted guitar on it and really drive it. Uh, and I think it's why this album excels for them is because they found so much be beautiful, uh, uh, so much beauty in their writing and it's, it's there to be had. <laughs> An unusual rhythmic pattern from Trey Cool opens Are We The Waiting, a number which initially has the stadium rock feel that wouldn't seem out of place at a Bon Jovi concert. Unsurprisingly, it quickly became another anthemic new favorite in the band's live set. I think it's probably one of the best songs on the album. And it, the, the only thing with it is not a long song. It's kind of an introduction to the next song which it runs straight into, but it's the way it builds and it just starts with this drum beat, which is a very kind of offbeat drum drum beat. You know, it's, it's not straightforward or anything like that. Just single drums hitting kind of at a, a slow tempo and the guitar comes in which is picking and the whole song gradually builds into this, this big chorus, which is just a chorus of course kind of thing. It's just a lot of people. It's the sort of thing you can imagine going and watching at a stadium and, and everybody in the, in the place singing along with it. It's that kind of song, the right tempo, just the right vibe. As a live band, they've always been such a huge draw that their, their live shows incorporated all these elements of kind of um, theatre and classic rock and just the sort of the experience of a live show. And that song, probably more than any other song on the album, really comes across live as quite a sort of mid-paced, emotional moment. I think in the, in the hands of other bands, it could have turned out really bad. It could have really been a sort of bad Bon Jovi. You know, if you take it out and go, well, we put it in the set, yeah, it's, you know, it's a everybody together sort of thing. But uh, in its place in the album and on the music, it, it, uh, uh, it, has, its, it has its right moment, um, I think. The Jesus of Saturnia is alive. The tempo rises as we hit one of the more raucous spots on the album. The quick change of tempo sees us in pure punk territory for a high energy song with a rock steady closing section. There you go, there you go, one, two, three, four, in you go, out you go, bang, it just happened. I think it 
again, it's a theme of the character. That's who he is, that's who St. Jimmy is. He's that punk, he's that angst, he's that drug, you know. That's all going on for him, that's his interest, that's what it's about, nothing else, nothing more. It's just about now and it's here and, you know, uh, and the 7-Eleven and the next uh, meal or drug, you know, it's, it's just that, it's as basic as that, so it's like a punk attitude. I love St. Jimmy, I mean, it's a, he's pretty cool, you know, it's, I, and he's pretty sexy, you know, but it's, uh, he's, um, uh, I don't know, it's just like, it's sort of part of a split personality that I think a, a lot of people have and um, it's sort of, they just get disconnected from themselves a little bit and maybe follow, follow a self-destructive path. And, uh, and I think St. Jimmy sort of um, symbolizes that, you know. You could just stick a Ramones track straight next to it and the two would sit quite nicely. I think it really is a, a return to form for Green Day. You do have these, very, these two very distinct sides to Green Day. You have the pop punk side which is the side that I personally love. And then you have that other side, that slightly more serious, the ballad side. I mean, that's what Green Day have always done. It's, it's something which kind of fits into all these different areas and therefore is the reason why they sell millions of more records than, than other bands or other contemporaries who would kind of put themselves in the same genre but really just don't do it as well. Despite the title, this isn't actually a song about drugs. Here, the Jesus of suburbia withdraws from the world emotionally, and Billy Joe uses the image of the pain-relieving drug to convey the sensation of a damaged ego, insulated from a painful world by feelings of hopelessness and isolation. Novocaine is the desensitizer to the horror of modern life. Billy Joe Armstrong singing about Novocaine, of course it's a drug which is a kind of sedative, uh, puts people to sleep if you like, numbs the pain. And I think he's using it as a sort of metaphor for wanting to escape from the sort of bombardment of the senses of American life and just the, you know, if you look too closely at what's going on in the world, there's a lot of horror there and I think this song is kind of trying to escape from that and just sort of you know, numbing yourself to the, to, to the world, or specifically to American life. Possibly one of the weaker moments on the album musically, it's kind of, it's, it's slower and it meanders along, which is not always what you want from a Green Day record, really. But um, lyrically, it's, 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 it's a strong song, as, as they all are on the album. With She's a Rebel, we are plunged back to the world of high-energy, fist-in-the-air punk rock. In an album filled with remarkable songs, there is the possibility that this upbeat song represents one of the more unremarkable moments. The impression is that he's made a statement about uh, uh, um, liberty, possibly, or, or you know, she being uh, the Lady Liberty uh, and, and uh, America as a whole. She's a person that never really, um, she never really, you know, wanes. You know, she never like falls from grace. Really, she, she's the one that kind of stuck to her beliefs. She's a rebel is a song on the album, which sort of um, it, it, it interlinks different sections. I mean. It, when you, when you play the record, you see the, the clever structuring of it in that they've, they've brought together different mu musical ideas and managed to kind of keep a consistency there. And this is one of those songs which kind of bridges a gap, if you like. It's, um, it's quite, a, quite a straightforward song. They're all telling the story. They're all necessary to form this concept album. Maybe if it wasn't a concept album and everything was just straightforward tracks, standalone songs, then maybe, but I still like it. I actually really like She's a Rebel just purely because it, it's got that whole kind of Ramones influence in it and it's just a, a great sound to have. One, two, three. Ooh. 
extraordinary girl maintains the sense of excitement. The melodic qualities of the song are particularly strong. Noticeable overtones of the Beatles, the Kinks and the Monkees abound in the 60s backbeat of this highly melodic and fun-filled romp. There, throughout the whole album, there's there's parts where you think it's it's a bit more poppy, and I don't know, maybe it was the the way the album was produced, but there there are definite parts in there where they're they're doing things they haven't done before, you know, that that sound a little bit lighter than than the sound they're used to, which is worth a try. But yeah, you, know, you could put it down to the the Beatles or, or the Monkees or or any kind of just the whole pop genre, really. But it's that poppy element which. Green Day have always acknowledged. They've never played it down. It was there right in the early singles, really. Um, it's that idea of just playing something simple and stripped down, but instant, sort of radio friendly. A song which appeals to four-year-old kids, 40-year-old kids, everyone, basically. That's, that's Green Day's real strength. They're punks, yep, they're punks. But they're not stupid. They are listening, they are aware and here you are, but they, they, they're drawing again on their influences and it's wonderful to hear and it's superbly executed as well. It's a great track and, and the richness of the vocals is great. Again, another classic uh, uh, approach to the writing. Lyrically, you know, not as intense and not as uh, extravagant, let's say, or, but it just, it works, it works. It works in a very simple way, but use of the melody line so wonderfully. When I hear that track, I hear Ramones. It is another one of these where it's taking those kind of melodic choruses. Yeah, perhaps the Ramones took it from the kind of 50s, 60s surfer style rock music. Perhaps that's where they got it from. But it was pushed through that kind of Ramonesy filter. It was given that garagey, punky, kind of slightly fuzzy around the edges feel. And that's the feel that Green Day are totally emulating with all of their songs particularly your extraordinary girl. The energy levels remain high for Letterbomb. Lyrically, we're told, it's a Dear John letter sent to the Jesus of suburbia, but also works as an address to the nation. Musically, it's an explosive blast of adrenaline, a slap in the face with the band's punk credentials pushed to the fore once again. I think Letter Bomb is another one that you know is very much written for bands. Bands of Green Day, they're looking for these great pop punk tunes, and you know Letter Bomb is a great song. It is very Green Day. Unlike some Jimmy, that just kicks you straight in the head and leaves you there uh, waiting for the next thing I think yeah this has all these hallmarks you know the the, uh, the, the intro the, the way he approaches his vocal uh, you know it's all like classic yeah, uh, great stuff from earlier from earlier Green Day it's lovely part of the, the strength of this song or the album as a whole is that you can you can read it from beginning to end and it, it does develop these ideas that you know when you when you view them in isolation song by song they can almost seem quite fractured and like they're not necessarily saying that much, but when you put it all together, the sum is greater than the parts. Letter Bomb just being one of the parts of this album, which is looking at the different facets of American society through these different voices, which Billy Joe conjures up throughout, through the lyrics and through the music. This is the moment when we step outside of the opera with a straight ahead melancholy rock song. The song has been misinterpreted as being about 9-11, but is actually a reflection on the death of Billy Joe's father, who passed away when the front man was just 10 years old. Um, 
you know, I know that that song. I mean, if there's one song that kind of veers away from the the story of the the album a little bit, it's that one. Um, so it's just a personal thing. I mean, I've never uh, really tackled an issue about it's like you know t singing about uh, my father or anything like that. And shortly before he died, he he uh, gave Billy Joe his first guitar. So obviously massive influence in, in that respect, um, you know, massive influence as most fathers are to most people, but it's, it's a, a topic which he hasn't really explored in much detail throughout the band's career. So it's almost odd that he chooses to do it on an album like American Idiot. Um, you would have thought that he might have sort of written songs about it earlier on. Um, but that said, it's a song which fits in perfectly with the album. The lyrics aren't specifically, um, well the lyrics are broad enough to kind of to offer a sort of, almost like a sense of closure to the album being as it is kind of like, um, again it sort of co it recalls a song like Give Me Novocaine, it's about wanting the, the horror of, of life to kind of pass, you know, he's saying he wants to sleep through whatever's going on, wake me up later. It's a song which is a very emotional song. Um, but again, it also works works well as a kind of anthemic stadium rock song. Um, another single off the album, which did very well. Autumn has now arrived. On October the 19th, heralds the second nine-minute epic on the album. This is Homecoming. By now, the Green Day crowd is definitely getting the message that the band has evolved musically. <laughs> A song like Homecoming is like to become to come back uh, to your hometown and find all these things, and you know, or, or else it couldn't be something else. It could be, you know, you could find, you know, your home might be a mental institution or prison or something like that, you know, um, which you know that could be, you know, someone's home. But um, it's um, yeah, it's a reflective ending, and it definitely is. It's open ended, you know, and we wanted it like that. Again, very simple chords, A, D, and E, and they're the, they're the chords that you, you probably learn when you're first learning guitar. But it's just, it's just the way that they're delivered kind of thing, nice and punchy, and, and it's, it's, the, it's the... It's the little feel bit there. Sort of changing quite quickly between the A and the D, which gives it that. You know, had it, had it just been... would have been too repetitive, too boring, so they put this little <laughs> fill in there that makes the whole thing kind of interesting, you know. <laughs> it's quite a poignant description of the demise of someone who's kind of had, had enough, if you like, this sort of song concludes with this St. Jimmy character uh, sort of quote unquote blowing his brains into the bay. Uh, it's about a suicide basically so you know how how cheery can a song like that be but it's it it delivers a lot of emotional impact and weight to the album and it's kind of it's it's one of the characters coming full cycle. <laughs> You know, moving the chords around really quickly. You know, they're, they're, again, not spending much time on, on one chord so it keeps the whole thing interesting. Um, it's gone from the last main set of chords, which were... Which you can hear were holding out a lot longer into... The, which makes the, the whole vibe of the song feel a lot more busy, a lot more going on, um, a lot more energy into, into the whole thing, you know. It's 
very schizophrenic sort of uh, suite of music, if you like. It, it goes into a song like Nobody Likes You, which is a sort of a big, another stadium chant, but with an almost sort of nursery rhyme structure to it, before again progressing into a song like um, Rock and Roll Girlfriend, which is it's probably one of the album's weakest moments. It's got Trey Cool on vocals, and it's it is basically a meatloaf pastiche. It sounds like it should be in the Rocky Horror Picture Show or something like that. It's based around kind of like a 12 bar blues type thing, you know, and again using the same chords A, D and, and E, you know, the straightforward chords, but it's just the way they're done and, and the, the lyric content on top. The, a song like Rock and Roll Girlfriend, I guess that's the most straightforward and, and most suitable chord progression you can use on it. Green Day handle it very well, I think. You know, they, they can go from singing about, you know, a corrupted society and, and the death of its citizens into a kind of be a drinking party song in the blink of an eye, but without kind of, you know, it, it sits quite easily on the ear because it's handled so well. After the excitement of Homecoming, the album closes on New Year's Day with What's Her Name. The What's Her Name character tells, you know, Jesus of Suburbia, St. Jimmy, um, what they, you know, what, what they don't want to hear, but inevitably that's what they were going for to begin with. And that's the whole twist of the whole thing. Musically, the song is slightly disappointing. The mid-tempo melodic qualities of the track are oddly reminiscent of, say, Split Ends or Crowded House. It seems as if the energy is gone and the band are so drained with the brilliance of what has gone before that there's nothing left in the tank. But maybe that's the point. Life in modern American life is draining, exhausting. Like the Jesus of suburbia, we are left to reflect on the memories of what once was. It's, it's prefaced by the song We're Coming Home Again, which really I think should or could have worked best as the album closer. That is a big kind of, uh, it's almost like a, like a, a regiment of voices singing in unison. Um, after that, it's hard to know where the album can go to, so that then they've, it's almost like they've tagged on this song as an afterthought. I think it's one of the strongest songs on the album, although it's, but where, it, where it's placed in the album after, especially after the song before it, which is another long song with all parts in it, it's kind of like an afterthought in a way, the way that it's been put on there, but if you listen to the song, it's actually one of, one of the catchy ones on the album, and you know, personally I would, have, I would have put it somewhere more towards the middle there. You know? Well, the, the, the first thing that, that I listened to it, I felt that it was it was a bit wacky uh, ending with that because you got to, uh, um, you know you've done the whole story prior to that you return home, you know, to Jimmy's death and the whole thing, and, and it sort of is a bit flappy about the edges, um, you know, a slower tempo, not really any angst in there anymore. But then. Again, uh, I know I've gone back to that, but if you think of the album as a whole, it's, a, it's a very much a, 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 a backward viewing point. So it's, it's a little reminiscent, it's a little, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a little more of a softer statement, let's say. But you've been through, you've been through a journey, is the idea. You've came through a journey, and uh, you know, most operas and most plays end with a death and they end with a soliloquy and so this is their soliloquy following a death to one of their central characters. I think What's Her Name is, it's a bit of a disappointing ending when you consider the opening for the American Idiot album, which is of course the title track, American Idiot, but then I guess when you're thinking of an opera, the ending of an opera is always going to be sort of slightly slower, it's the pulling together of everything. And 
Would you really want to end an album on the same note that you started it with a kind of this great explosive pop punk record? So although it's disappointing in terms of a song, I think it was a necessary ending for the album. I'm sure you'll agree that in American Idiot, Green Day have produced a true rock masterpiece, which thoroughly deserves the accolades it has received. It is a record which looks destined to weather the musical trends and be a landmark record of the decade. I think it's, it's definitely their landmark album. You know, so far the, the album's had four singles off of it, which if you can do that with an album with any band, especially if you've not been around for, for around a decade, then in, on these shores anyway, then it's saying something. American Idiot is an album which gets them out to a new fan base. It pulls them back out from the underground where they'd snuck back into um, with the last few albums. It's pushed them back up into that public awareness. It's a great album. I would say American Idiot is Green Day's best album to date. It's probably the one album they will be remembered for or people know them for now. I think over time it'll be proven that you know they had a handful of great albums and then by no means a one trick pony i mean they discovered um, you know a whole a whole kind of a whole new fan base basically um, when they released american idiot but like i said they've got a, they've built a, a long lasting career they already had one before the album is it a specific moment for them um, it's not like the album with uh, 20 number one hits on it's a cinematic, it's a, a thematic album, um, so in that way it's their Sgt. Pepper or their Wall or whatever because uh, you know, it, it, has that, it has that theme to it and, and uh, the names and the frames are all interconnected throughout the whole piece, um, you know, and, and written as such, so uh, uh, yeah. So I think, you know, it's probably, they'll never do it again, you may never want to do it again, uh, but there it is, so I think uh, uh, it's definitely a landmark album for them, definitely. The Grammys is like one of the only things that they give us all a Grammy, which is to their credit. They give you dummy Grammys. <laughs> at first, so the first thing you do is you're, you're like walking off with this trophy, you're like, yes, and then all of a sudden, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. holding the same Grammy on TV. I, this is for Alicia Keys next. <laughs> Sorry. You're like, ooh, she's going to win, huh? Uh, so yeah. it's like getting your diploma then? Uh, yeah, pretty much. If I knew what that was like. <laughs> Two, one, two, three, four! I'm a Green Day! Don't want to be the mad guy, idiot. One nation controlled by the media. Information age of hysteria. Go!